All right, announcements are done. Now let's talk about worship. I love worship. Um, the three things that we talked about you can do to grow closer to, the, to God in this series are prayer, studying the scriptures, and worship. There it is. Cool. You guys got it too. I'm not in charge of it this week. I feel a little out of, out of control. I trust her, but it's weird. Um, so, so these three things are good ways to connect with the Lord. Praying to God is connecting with him socially. You talk to him. You listen to him, waiting for him to speak to you. Good stuff. You're connecting with him socially. Studying the word is a good way to connect with him intellectually. By studying the word, you hear the things that he said to the prophets, and through praying, you'll hear the things that he speaks to you through his word. Uh, studying the word is wonderful. If you want to know who God is, study his word. If people are questioning God and you're like, I don't know how to answer them, the answer is in his word. We need to study his word to know it. If people are trying to draw you away from God and you're, they're telling you things, you're like, that doesn't feel right. The way you know if it's right or not is to study his word. You connect with God intellectually. Worship is connecting with God emotionally. And this is the one, really, I'm the worst at out of the three of these. I love praying. I love studying scriptures. I still love worship. I'm just not as good at it because I'm not really an emotional type of person. But as much as I am, I love to worship the Lord because you, you're telling him how great he is, how wonderful he is, how good he is, and how much he's done in your life. And you are appreciating him for everything that he's done, is doing, and will do in the future. And the reason we worship through song, and song's not the only way to worship, but the reason we worship through song is song is such an emotional expression already that it just makes sense to worship him emotionally in song. So with that, we're going to go through the Psalms. I could have chosen all of the Psalms and many other scriptures besides. Romans 12 was a good one, but I didn't choose it because I'm thinking, you guys don't want to be here all night listening to me. I got other stuff to do, and you guys got other stuff to do. Uh, but we'll start in Psalm 18, and I didn't even pick the whole psalm, just 46 through 49. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of sal my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. Have you noticed that David never says, God and I destroyed those people? I've read all of the Psalms, and he never once claims credit with God in destroying his enemies or overcoming his enemies or victory. He always gives all of the glory to God, and that's where it belongs. We realize that we have no strength outside of him. We think we do sometimes. We think we're strong. But compared to God, we are not. Compared to our enemy, we are weaklings. We need him and we need his strength. And think of how good it is to, to be surrounded on all sides by your enemy, to think that death is intimate, the enemy has won, and then God shows up and takes them all out. That really happened. There was a time in, um, I want to say it's 1 Kings 19, but maybe Chronicles 19. I forget what, what the reference is. Or 2 Kings or something. Anyway, the point is uh, that, that Ju Jerusalem was surrounded by the Assyrian army surrounded, and they didn't know what was going to happen. Hezekiah heard, he was the king, he heard the, uh, the, the enemy talk, and they wrote him a letter saying all this bad stuff, we're going to do this, we're going to do this to you, and he took it to the temple, and he laid it out before the Lord. And then one night, God sent one angel down to kill 185,000 of the enemy soldiers. So the next morning when the general arose, General Sennacherib or whatever you say his name, he didn't have an army left, and he had to go home because it was just him then. And 185,000, imagine waking up. You went to bed scared for your life. You can't hold out much longer. The enemy is going to overrun you. They are going to take you away like they took away your brethren up in northern Israel. And you wake up in the morning, and they're gone. How amazing would that feel? Now take that amazing feeling and turn it towards the Lord and say, you did this. You did this. 
And that's not the only time God rescued. God rescued dozens of times. Read through the scriptures and you will find them. This, this one says, the Lord lives, blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. That means lifted up. It is God who avenges me. And I'm so glad I don't want to have to avenge myself. That sounds like a lot of work. And subdues people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. Do you guys have enemies? Are they after you? God delivers. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You've delivered me from the violent man. And then there's, this is what he's going to do. Because God's done all of that, therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. Amongst people who don't know you, I'm going to lift your name up. I'm going to tell them who you are, and I'm going to sing praises to your name so that they will know who you are, so that they will worship him too. Worship is also evangelistic. Let's sing another song. Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, oh worship your holy Oh, oh. 
We sing these songs. We focus on the lyrics, and do we do, do we do you ever come across a song you're like I don't know if I can sing that truthfully, you know? It's like I give my all to you. It's like well I, I I do right now, you know. But sometimes I don't think I do, and but sometimes these songs like even if they don't express our reality, they express what our heart is. I want to give my all to you, and and just because we fail, that shouldn't stop us from coming to the Lord over and over again. When we worship him, we worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit, that the spirit moves through us and teaches us what we need to do. And in truth, our own reality, that we know that we don't measure up to who we want to be. But you know what? God's not done with us yet. He is still working on us. And, and as long as the desire of our heart is what we are singing, then God takes that worship. And we need, to, we, we need to work at it. We, we can't just say, oh, I, I want to, but I'm not going to try. Of course we're going to try. But we just know if we fail, God still loves us. There isn't a single thing that you have done, are doing, or will do that God doesn't know about. It's not, that, it's not like, you know, Jesus died for you on the cross, and then he's watching you from heaven, and then he goes, well, that's worthless now because you're doing that sin. Of course he knew that sin was going to happen. He died for that sin. He already paid for that sin. doesn't mean you should do it anyway just because Jesus paid for it, but it means that it's not a surprise to Jesus. Just so you are, are, are confident in this, your stupidity is not big enough to keep God away from you. No matter how much you think you can mess up, you can't mess up greater than God has foreseen, greater than God has already paid for, greater than God loves you. God still loves you. He knew it was going to happen. He paid for it anyway. And he still loves you. Don't stop coming to God because you don't think you're good enough. Because you're not good enough. No one's good enough. That's why he had to die for us in the first place. If we were good enough, we wouldn't even need him but we're not, so we do. And that should be a comfort to you because then you don't have to try to be perfect before God. Just be yourself and let God change you from the inside. The next psalm we have is Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. Okay, another proclamation of praise to the Lord because he's not as enemies come out to him. O Lord, I cried out to you and you healed me. O oh Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Do you know how much the Lord has done for you? I don't think any of us know how much the Lord has done for us. But do we realize how, how close we were to death, to hell, before Jesus saved us? There was nothing stopping us. That's where we were going. Sometimes we just think that we're a good person and good people go to heaven and, and, and it's true, if we really were a good person, we could get to heaven without him, but we're not really that good. Because that standard is not just being better than the next guy, it's perfection. Sure, you could find 10 people who, who are worse than you, but if you take that to the Lord, it's, it's not like he's going to say, well, okay, those guys are worse than, worse than you, then, so you could come in. It's like going to the grocery store and saying, I will give you five cents for this watermelon. And I can find 10 people who are only going to give you one cent. So you should sell it to me for five. They're like, Dude, it's two bucks. Give me two bucks or go home. It's like they already have the price set. The price for heaven is perfection. And none of us could pay it. Even though we think we're worth more than some other guy, it's still not enough. And we have to realize that we were on the road to hell. Eternal damnation eternal separation from the living God. And God reached down into that filth and pulled us out. And we need to remember that, to be thankful for that, so that we can rejoice with the others in his holy name. And then it says, Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks for the remembrance of his holy name. 
For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for life. Think God gets angry? Yeah, God gets angry. He's slow to anger, right? But he does get angry. But his anger is for a moment. Remember when he got angry with the Hebrews? Like, you got to be really messed up to make God angry. See how patient he was with those Hebrews wandering around the desert for 40 years? Like, they were in Egypt as slaves. Moses came in as God's representative to rescue them. They saw all ten plagues. They walked through on dry ground with water on both sides crossing the Red Sea. They stood before the Lord's mountain, which was on fire, and they heard his voice proclaim from the fire the Ten Commandments. When we read Exodus 20, we are reading God's word. They're scared of God, which, you know, understandably so at that point. They send Moses up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And while he's up there, they make a golden cow. And they start worshiping it, saying, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. It's like, you just made that. You just made that. You can't worship it as the God who brought you out of Egypt. It didn't exist ten minutes ago. They caused God to be angry at them. They saw more miracles than any other generation ever. They walked for 40 years in the desert. Their shoes never gave out. Their clothes never wore out. They followed a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud during the day. Water came from rocks. Food fell from the sky. These guys saw more miracles, and yet they still hardened their necks against the Lord. There was no worship in their hearts. It caused God to be angry. Now, how many of you can compete with that? We can't. His anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime, even though he pronounced judgment on that generation. He brought their kids into the Holy Land. And he has protected their children and their children's children and their children's children to this very day. Every generation of Jew that there ever was, there has been an enemy who tried to wipe them out. Every enemy has failed. They are still there today. God's chosen people back in God's promised land. They are still there. God has protected them. He has rescued them. He has given them every, every reason to worship. Do they do it? Whether or not you say yes or no to that, do you worship? You have been given so many reasons to worship. You were on the road to hell, and he has plucked you out of that spot and put you in the middle of his presence, in the middle of his will. And his Holy Spirit is inside you and leads you and teaches you you have so much more than they did. Do you worship God? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Life's hard, but the best parts come. And you might say, well, okay, not just the night, but like all of life is hard. And until from now until I day, it's going to be hard. But guess what? When you die, it's not the end. You have eternity to wake up into. This whole lifetime, this whole 6,000 years that the earth is here, it's like a night in the life of eternity. It's just one night. After that, it's only day. And when we get to heaven, heaven, like not just a 1,000 years, but to, to, to the, the new kingdom, there's, like, there's going to be no nighttime. It's all going to be day all the time. Some of us are like, well, what does that mean? Like, do we get morning times? Do we get to sleep? And, and the honest answer is, I don't know. I don't know. But you know what? I'm not going to complain about it. There's not going to be a bunch of people complaining about heaven and heaven going, I wish it was nighttime. You know? And there's going to be no sea. It's like the surfers are like, what are we going to do? You'll find something else. I don't know what it's going to be, but you're not going to be in heaven complaining. There's no ocean to surf on. You're going to, be, you're going to have a good time there. And we know that. And we can worship him now for the great time we're going to have then because we know it's coming. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and the Lord, I'm, to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? The psalmist is saying, 
what's the point if I die, God? Who's going to praise you if I die? I am praising you now. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned, me, turned for me my mourning and the dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. When times are hard, when times are hardest, we need to turn to God and not just ask him for help. We need to turn to God and worship him. Put all of our, our thoughts and our feelings and emotions on the Lord and worship him. Non-Christians can't worship God. They especially can't worship him when, they're, when life is hard. And there are a lot of non-Christians who pretend to be Christians who worship the Lord when times are good, but when times are hard, they turn against him. But real Christians will worship him. Just like Job, right? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. It's like we're going to trust the Lord and we are going to serve the Lord. And we're going to worship the Lord no matter what. Let's sing another song. What greater reason do we need to, to worship God than to think about his son Jesus? All that he's done for us. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, a Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone
Psalm 95 starts out, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. We need to remember who God is. He's the creator, the creator of the heavens and the earth. The wonderful things that we travel all across the U.S. to see, the rock formations, the oceans. God made all of that. The things we see in the night sky, the moon, the stars. God made all of that. All the animals creeping by. The big majestic trees that grow up high. God made all of that. And not only did he make all of that, he made you, he made me, he made the president, he made everybody. And on top of all of that, he hears you. He knows you. He loves you. If I called up the White House and said I wanted to talk to the president, I would not get very far. They would not let me talk to him. I do not have the president's ear. If I called the governor's office, one of 50 guys, right, under the president, and I I said, I want to talk to the governor, I would not get very far. I do not have the governor's ear. I don't even know who the mayor of Chico is, but I don't think I could talk to him either. But the Lord God, master of all, creator of all, I don't even have to pick up the phone. All I got to do is think towards him, point my heart towards him, call out to him, Father, Dad, Abba, he hears me, he knows me, he loves me. That is the creator I serve. That is the God I have. Psalm 95 goes on to say, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion, as in the day of trial of the wickedness when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is the people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's God talking about the people in the wilderness. We talked about them already. God says, don't be like them. They saw everything. They believed nothing. And here we are on the other side of that. Do we get to see God? Not face to face, not yet. Do we get to see his miracles happen? Yes, but not like they saw them. What they saw was God's work physically in their lives, and that no one could deny that it was God. He proved it. But now people go, well, we have science to explain all of this stuff. Like, Well, okay, but science doesn't explain why it happens. It just explains what we can figure out about it. And it's not that much. Do we still worship the Lord, whom we have not seen? In 1 John it says, how, if, if you say you, you love God, but you hate your brother, you're a liar. How can you love uh, Love God who you haven't seen if you can't even love your brother whom you have seen. It says we can't see God. And then when Thomas asked, um, well, I forgot what he asked. Now I didn't write it down. But But Jesus answered because that's the most important thing, right? Jesus answered and said that you believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who have not seen yet still believe. That's us he's talking about. We have not seen Jesus, but we still believe. And how blessed are we that we get to worship him. Let's sing that song. So right from that Psalm, Psalm 95, this song comes, Come let us worship and bow down. Come let us worship and bow down 
Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture. And the sheep of His hand. Just a sheep. worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our our God. worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand, just a sheep of His hand. next song, Psalm 96, says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is feared. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come to, into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in its, all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Let all the, then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he, is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. God is not only the creator, God is also the judge. We have gone astray, the world has gone astray, and God will come and he will judge it. And his judgment upon us has already been paid for by Jesus on the cross. 
I don't know if we will get to see all of the sins that we committed when we get to heaven. I hope not. I'd be able to take a while. But I'm sure if we would see all of them, we would be so ashamed of the life of the lives that we've led here on this earth. But how much better would we feel when Jesus comes and says, I took all of that. It is all washed away. None of it can be attributed to you anymore. You're free. God is that good. And the people who wronged us, the people who, who uh, don't forgive, the people who reject the Lord, God will judge them too, and their judgment is not paid for by Jesus Christ. Not because Jesus doesn't love them. He loves them. But when he asked them, they said no. And so they will have to answer for their own sin. And it's sad, but that is right. And we worship God for always doing what is right. No matter how hard it is. But we praise him for coming down and dying on that cross to remove that judgment that we deserve from us. Let's sing the hymn again. The splendor of the King Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God.
is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. I got one more psalm for you tonight, Psalm 100. And like I said, there are so many psalms out there and so many other scriptures we could use, but you're probably going to get hungry. I know I will. So you got to cut it short sometime. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. Be thankful to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. If we know God, worship is our natural response. If we understand who God is, worship is our natural response. If we have a relationship with God, worship is our natural response. If we understand our salvation, worship is our natural response. Yes, we should sing, but not because we're told to, because it's our natural response of who God is and what he's done for us. It is our outpouring of love back to the creator who loved us first, who first sung over us because of his love towards us. We love him because he first loved us. And we sing to him because he first sang for us. I wonder what it was like when we were created in our mother's womb. Did he sing to us then? The way parents sing to their children? We sing to our children all the time. Even if we don't think we have a good voice. I don't think I have a good voice. And one of the reasons I don't think I have a good voice is because I've been told that. There was this one time. I was wondering if I was going to share this story or not, how I was going to fit in. I guess it fits in here. There's this one time I was at this, uh, I was at a college group worship night. And I was just singing my heart out to the Lord. It was a time in my life where I was just coming into my stride, walking with the Lord, learning from him. And it seems like every week at this college group, he hit me with something else, hit me with something else. And I loved him for it, but it was hard, but it was good. And so this one time I was just singing, and I thought I was sounding pretty good. I wasn't. The guy in front of me turns around after the service is over, big smile on his face, and says, I just want to thank you for standing behind me and singing your heart out. And I was like beaming at that point. I was thinking, great. Then he continued. He should have just stopped there, but he didn't. He said, you sing so bad and so loud like you didn't have a care in the world. I just didn't know I was singing bad. And he says, you made me feel so much better because I can't sing either. And so I was a little humbled that day. But worship is not coming. How great you sound, right? What does it say? Make a joyful noise. I was making a joyful, disordinate noise. But it was still a joyful noise to the Lord. And he loved it. And somehow with that weird message, he told me he loved it. Although it kind of hit my pride a bit. But that probably needed to go down anyway. Does it matter how good you are at singing? Absolutely. Does it matter where your heart is? Absolutely. You could be the best singer. And if your heart's not in it, God hears nothing. You could sing like a cat on fire. But if your heart's in it, God loves it. I love hearing my kids going around singing. Can they hit the notes? Probably not. I can't tell. But does it matter? No. If they're singing, they're happy. And I love it. Until they become teenagers, then the songs get dark, right? But right now, when they're little, when they're singing, it's always happy stuff. And I love seeing my kids happy. And every time I, I, I think about me and my kids, I think that's how God looks down on us. He loves to get us happy. Worship is our natural response to God's love. Are our lives filled with worship? Do we go around singing in our hearts to the Lord? Even if it's not loud because, you know, other people are around. We don't want to disturb them. Cat's on fire, right? 
But in our hearts, are we singing to him? Are we praising him for the things that we are noticing him doing in our lives? Or are we just too focused on our problems and our troubles to care? But when we're focused on our problems and troubles, we are telling God, you're not big enough to handle this. That's why I have to worry about it. Now, we wouldn't actually say that to God, right? You wouldn't pray and tell God, you're not big enough to handle this, so I'm worried about it. I'm anxious about it. I'm trying to figure this out because you're not going to do anything. We would never say that to God because we wouldn't dare. But, you know, when we're worried about stuff, when we're anxious about stuff, that's what we're telling him. That's why he says, do not worry. That's why he says, don't be anxious. You know, I, I, I was worried about stuff when I was reading the Bible, and I got to that part in Matthew where it says, do not worry because the flowers of the field, the birds of the air, and I told God, I'm not worried. I'm just anxious. And then I get to Philippians where it says, be anxious for nothing. And it's like, well, God covered that one too. I guess I should just be okay with him then. And it's true. Be okay. And if you got little kids, and I got little kids, they're seven, five, and two, and, and, and they're wandering around, do you know what they're worried about? They just want to watch a show. They want to play a game. They want to cuddle on the couch with us. Like, they don't care about the big, important stuff because... They think we got that handled, my wife and I. And we're like, I don't know what we're going to do. I guess we should just trust God the same way our kids trust us. They get it, our kids. Be able to trust that someone else is going to take care of it. And you just have to be in the moment. And that's what worship is. It's coming to Christ like a child. Being in the moment. Knowing that he has everything taken care of. So make a joyful shout, all you lands, and serve the Lord with gladness. Let's sing another song. Last one? Maybe? Yeah, last one. All right. Let's all stand together.
Lord Jesus, you are an amazing God. Thank you so much that we can worship you tonight. And I want to pray, Lord, that if there's anyone out here who does not know you, Jesus, you died for our sins, you rose again, that we might belong to you. And if that's you right now, and you want to worship the Lord with your whole heart, but you don't have a relationship with him yet, this is your night. Just raise your hand so I can see you and I can pray with you. So you can tell Jesus, yes, I want to be yours. If you're watching this later and you want to pray, this is, this is a simple prayer we can pray. Say, dear Jesus, I have sinned. And the punishment of sin is death. I know that's what I deserve, Jesus. But you have given your life on that cross to give my life back to you. And with my life back to me, Lord, I want to praise you with all of it. I want to worship you completely. Please, please be my God. Let me be your child forever and ever. Pray this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. If you have prayer, if you have prayer, if you would like prayer, come on down. We'll be happy to pray with you. Let's drive safe home. Michael, you too, good evening.